My name is Terry Todd, and I'm the director of the Stark Center for Physical Culture and Sports here at UT. And I'm Jan Todd, and I'm a professor in the kinesiology department, and I also am the co-director of the center. I began lifting weights the summer after my high school work had finished, graduated, and I started lifting. Back then, almost no people did weight training, but I wanted to try it, and so did. And I became interested and went through and did competitions, and this led me to the academic specialty, and where I've really essentially made my living in my life. When I met him and we got together, I began training, and I was not at that point actually thinking about an academic career, but got involved with lifting as he did, and then also began wondering about it. And in my case, it was sort of more curiosity about why people felt the way they did when women wanted to lift weights and be strong. Physical culture is, um, is an older term, although it's coming back into uh, academic discourse. And in fact, there's a movement in sports sociology in some parts to rename sports sociology physical cultural studies. But basically, it has to do with practices, regimens, uh, dietary practices that are used to both enhance human performance and also to change and transform the body. I think one of the things we can learn from physical culture has to do with our ideas about the body itself. I mean, it is in part the idea that we can take the human organism and transform it. If you just think about the simple uh, fact of how many women athletes now use weight training in some way, shape, or form to prepare for themselves for sport, it is a, a dramatic sea change. Look how we admire Serena Williams. And Serena is an extremely powerful athlete. So at least within a sports setting, if we have an athlete who has you know, true power, that combination of speed and explosiveness and, uh, and strength. I think we have now gotten to the point where we can admire that. LeBron James weighs about 275 pounds, and he has played at 300 pounds. Shaquille O'Neal played for years at 350 pounds. Djokovic, Nadal, when you look at the bodies of these people, you, you can't see them very well because they wear these very loose-fitting clothes, but I've seen some photographs of Djokovic and he looks like he's just made out of a tube steel. The part of the story that we're not understanding and we're not talking enough about right now in the world of modern sports is the fact that it isn't just drugs that are creating the changes in the way the bodies of athletes look. Everybody sort of assumes that if you see a Raphael Nadal and he's got biceps and he's a tennis player that something's wrong. But the story that's missing and that we're not giving enough press to is the training that athletes now do, which is unparalleled in the history of sports. When you look at the history of doping in the last 40 years, it's really quite fascinating because the, the ethical arguments that people use to resist, to sort of suggest resistance to the idea that, I, that athletes should dope have changed a lot over time. In the 70s and 80s, for the most part, philosophers were talking about the fact that we needed to protect sport that we needed to have an, a level playing field. And if you think about baseball in particular, like, you know, the, the sluggers, you know, the whole notion of the home run hitters, that really is kind of a phenomenon of the 90s and beyond when we know that drugs were really starting to enter baseball for, in, in, in ways that they hadn't before that time. The thing that I think works best, and it's the choice that I made for myself because I didn't use anabolic steroids back during my career, and that's to try to find ways to convince people of the, um, the value of competing within your own body as, as given. Terry and I have dreamed about having a facility like the Stark Center, trying to create a space where scholars can come and where we actually have what I have to say I think are really terrific graduate students who come and work now and particularly study the intersections of exercise and sport and health and, and alternative medicine. I think what we were trying to do, and I think we have done, is to create a place in North America where people who want to study the history of physical culture and sports can really have access to the kind of archives that don't exist anywhere else in North America and probably the world. Having the materials at the University of Texas is the pathway we hope to making sure that these materials are not lost, that they're preserved, and that future generations of scholars will be able to come here and look at Daryl Royal's scrapbooks, look at Tom Kite's scrapbooks, look at the materials on physical culture that we have, and they'll understand what America's sporting and physical culture life 
was really like in ways that they won't by not having access to that material.